Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. I have a special guest with us. It's the world champion, Judah Friedlander. Hi, Judah. What's up? Good to be here. Now, you check out Judah's uh, Netflix special. It's called America is the Greatest Country in the United States, and it's up for a Webby Awards. Everybody check that out. Go to judahfriedlander.com, right? That is correct. All right. It's a great special. Look at our other video about it. But right now we're talking about what's happening in Syria. Today's Monday. And uh, I just want to remind what people, what FDR said in 1936. He said, we had to struggle with the old enemies of peace, business and financial monopoly, speculation, reckless banking, class antagonism, sectionalism, and war profiteering. So that's what's going on right now. We're dealing with the old enemies of peace, business and finance monopoly, speculation, reckless banking, class antagonism, sectionalism, and war profiteering. That's what's happening right now. That's why we're in Syria. And I saw this. I thought this was great. Ed, uh, Syria bombing. Editor's note. Do you support the missile attack in Syria? And she responds, I'm just thankful that Syria didn't bomb us for poisoning the children in Flint or gassing the natives at Standing Rock. So you see what see. You get that. You get that right. She's a she's a great joke writer. Yeah. I mean, in addition to being on point, she's a great joke writer. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a great joke. That's a perfectly written joke there. I'd like to hire her. Yeah. She's great. So now what I want to do is very quickly just remind people that we have a history of inventing a pretend problem that we can then invade someone's country and steal their natural resources. So. Uh, let's go back. For we all know that Vietnam was based on the Gulf of Tonkin, which turned out to be not true. So the, Viet the whole Vietnam War was pretend. Uh, well, it wasn't pretend. It was real and it was horrible, but it was out on a pretend reason. And then the next one was the, uh, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War with George 1991, George Herbert Walker Bush. And I don't know if you remember it. There was a problem. The people didn't want to go to war because we still remembered Vietnam, even in 1991. And so they had to figure out a way to get people to go on board with it. And what they usually do is propaganda. And here's a uh, this is a great little piece that explains what happened. Iraq attacks Kuwait, claiming the Kuwaitis are slant drilling into Iraq's oil fields. U.S. President George Herbert Walker Bush pushes for a land war against Iraq. But polls show the U.S. public is split 50-50 on that idea. Then comes this eyewitness testimony. So the country split 50-50 on us going into Kuwait and Iraq. And then... ...a congressional committee from a 15-year-old Kuwaiti girl. The claim is she cannot be identified for fear of reprisals. So we have to keep this 15-year-old girl whose testimony is going to swing the war. We have to keep her identity a secret because someone might come to get her for telling the truth. Here we go. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators. Took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. The U.S. public is outraged. The result? Support for land war zooms. It Boom! That's all it took. That's all it took was that testimony. And I remember, I'm old enough to remember when that, that's before the internet, when that happened. And I remember that being on the news, all ubiquitously shown on the news about how horrible. And I was like, oh my God, we have to attack. And here, turning point. Desert Storm is launched. 135,000 Iraqis are killed. An estimated one million Iraqis, many of them children and old people, then die as a result of 10 years of sanctions. One small problem. There never were any incubator baby deaths. Not one. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's investigative flagship program, The Fifth Estate, reveals the girl to be the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter, given her lines and coached in acting by the giant American PR firm Hill & Knowlton. It's one phase in a $10 million joint U.S.-Kuwaiti campaign of deception. This man is lying. I myself buried 14 newborn babies that had been taken from their incubators. This man is lying. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. There were a lot of people who participated in a conspiracy, yes, an out-and-out -out conspiracy, of fake organizations, false documents, fraud, and disinformation. So, so now you know the rest of the story 
on the first Gulf War. Dude, do you remember the first Gulf War? Yes, I do. I believe it was uh, 1991, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And what, Desert what, Shield, and then it was Desert Storm. Yes. And what was your feeling about it at the time? Yeah, not good. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Uh, I didn't know better. At yeah. the time, I didn't know better. Yeah. I believe the news reports. I believe that they were doing that stuff. I didn't yeah. know any better. I didn't, there wasn't the internet back then. And yeah, I remember, uh, I think, being against that. The, the next Gulf War, I remember I initially was like, these guys know how awful Vietnam went and things like that. They're not going to make that same mistake again. They're not going to risk, you know. Then I was like, quickly I realized, oh, no, it's the same old thing. Yeah. Well, here's, a, here's a <clears throat> Colonel Wilkerson, who was the chief of staff to Colin Powell during the first Gulf War. And here's what he had to say about that first Gulf War. Here's what he says about it. Well, let me uh, let me just back up a little bit and say that the first Gulf War, which of course was Powell's uh, first, we're going to cut it off and then we're going to kill it with regard to the Iraqi army, um, opened my eyes to a certain extent about the Middle East and about the Strait of Hormuz and the Persian Gulf and Saudi Arabia and others. Um, the reason we fought that war was not to uphold UN mandates. It was not to uh, prove that the new world order was going to be established well by George Herbert Walker Bush. It was to protect oil. Um, the reason we put forces down in the desert early was to keep Saddam Hussein from turning right and going into Saudi Arabia. Uh, we knew if he did, his tanks would roll over the 82nd Airborne Division we'd put on the ground, but uh, his tanks would be rolling over U.S. soldiers, and that would be cost us belly for sure. So I, my, my eyes began to be opened even more in this pragmatic way as to why the United States was using force in the world these days. In this case, it was all about oil. Uh, of course, that would come back again in 2003 when we reinvaded Iraq and threw out all kinds of aspersions for reasons to the contrary, but we still were going back for oil, basically. So. This is, a, this is a continuity, if you will, that gets established in terms of abusing me of my naivete, what, what little was left as to why the United States in the post-World War II period uses force so often. Now, be, before we... So there you have it. We went to the Iraq first time for oil. We went there the second time for oil. And we had to lie to the American public to do it. So your government lies to you to get you to, to go to war. And then the news media are stenographers because they're owned by the people who make profits off of war. And they're funded by them. Why do you think climate change is still a debate on <laughs> network news? It's because they're funded by fossil fuel companies. It's not a debate in science. It's not a debate in the real world. But it's still a debate on Brian Williams' news show because he's funded by fossil fuel companies and the military-industrial complex. Boeing does advertisements on Meet the Press. Are you looking to buy a jet? I'm not looking to buy a jet. Why would they be doing that? Because the news organizations are supposed to investigate people, and so they give them the money not to fund their investigation, but to fund their non-investigations. And that's why Meet the Press is supported by Boeing, Halliburton, Archer, Daniel Midland, and fossil fuel companies. So now we just got it straight from the horse's mouth, and you're never, never going to hear this guy on MSNBC during a run-up to a war. Did you see this guy anywhere on MSNBC or CNN or ABC? Are they quoting him in the Washington Post or the New York Times? Of course they're not, because Jeff Bezos is the richest megalomaniac in the world's history, owns the Washington Post, is in bed with the CIA to the tune of $600 million, and he sits on a Pentagon board. So you know goddamn well that Washington Post is going to be pro-war in Syria. And they are, just like they were pro-war in Iraq the last two times, and they're pro-war in Libya. The United States media is ubiquitous in their rush to war before an investigation. I, uh, I always think of it this way, like when you look at wars and you want to figure out if this is a just war or not, because war should always be, first of all, it should never happen. If it does, it should be a last ditch Resort. for just for survival, right. you know, but it's pretty much always rich guys starting a war and they send the poor guys out there to fight the war. You know, now if Jeff Bezos and uh, Elon Musk and uh, uh, Warren Buffett and all, if all these billionaires are out there strapping on machine guns and going out to the Middle East to fight, I'm like, oh, well, maybe, 
Maybe this is, this is serious. Maybe this is serious. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but until then, I think you can basically assume. All right, somebody's making a lot of money that, off of this. Yes, you know? it's pretty, and that's what life is about. It's about making money. Life Let's be is serious. about. Yeah, people yeah. don't get that. I mean, the, the military industrial complex, they get it. Yeah. It's just uh So So you always got to be suspect, you know. I mean, it's But but the media is never suspect. No. Isn't that they're, wild? I mean, the same people who covered Iraq and Libya are covering this war and they're covering it exactly the same way. That's why propaganda I find is it's fascinating because I think most cultures no matter where you are, you always think it's that other country or culture that's doing the propaganda yeah, or yeah. or the party I vote for, they're giving me the real stuff, but it's that other party <laughs> yeah. doing the propaganda. It's like hardly anyone ever notices that uh, propaganda, it can be everywhere. It can be from all different angles. You know, it's not just those other people. That's right. You know, and well, a lot of people don't see that. And that's how effective propaganda is that it off, people often don't see it. Used you know? to be illegal for the American intelligence community, the CIA, to do propaganda on Americans. Barack Obama lifted that restriction. Oh, really? Wow, yes. I didn't even know that. And he wow. got rid of, and he also signed the uh, Na- National Defense Authorization Act, and in Section 1021, he signed it on New Year's Eve. And huh. Section 1021 repeals habeas corpus. So that's our great savior. That's the Barack Obama. And now you know why we have Trump. Here's uh, another thing I want to add sure. about the whole Trump thing. It's like, I was thinking about this the other day. If things really were going great in this country, <laughs> you know what I mean? Let's say, you know, there was uh, equal pay for women, uh, health care, you know, if, let, let's say pretty much every uh, wage. Ev- yeah, every everyone in society from every background is financially doing well. People are safe. Do you think Trump would have had a chance of winning? No. You know, like no, it, Trump, Trump is I a- mean, I'm not saying Sweden's perfect, but let's just say Sweden, for example. If he had run last year or whatever in Sweden against him, do you think he would have had a chance? I don't. I don't think he would have had a chance. No. So I think what you're saying is there's a reason he got elected. There's a reason yeah. why he got elected, and it was because people are hurting, and the system was offering them nothing. They yeah. were offering them more of the same. They were offering them Hillary Clinton, the person who passed NAFTA and cut the legs out from underneath unions. At the same time, they were gutting welfare, exploding the prison population, calling black kids super predators, and then they deregulated Wall Street, which crashed the economy within 10 years, and black and brown people got hurt the most from that. And then you go, why won't they vote? That's why they voted for Trump. Hispanics voted for Trump, for F's sake. So there you go. Judith, thanks for being our guest. Thanks for having me here, man. Keep, uh, keep doing your thing, man. Okay, brother. Yeah. Please make sure you subscribe. Even if you think you are, you're probably not. Just takes a second to check and then click the bell so they give you a notification when we drop a video. They probably won't notify you because they're trying to suppress independent news, but that's all we can do. June 30th, we're in Portland, Oregon. If you can become a patron, we give you hours of bonus material every week. And we're on Steam It. We're steaming it right now. Plus, on Saturdays, we do our Super Chat. It's a solid chat Saturday. You ask us questions, we'll talk back. That's at 2 p.m. Pacific time on Saturdays. Thanks for your support.